Are y'all full of Christmas jeer, or cheer, not jeer, jeer, <laughs> jeer or booing at the, at the end of this lesson? That's what I was, you know, you, you always have your worst fear before you get up to teach. It's like, please, no jeering. Uh, Christmas jeer. Wow, that sounds really loud. Uh, okay, I'm good. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm excited to teach. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 21. Um, just a couple of church-wide announcements. I know we've said this, but we actually, this past week, we have added an additional Christmas Eve service on Christmas Eve. So there will be one Christmas Eve Eve, um, on, which is January 23rd. That's at 6 p.m. December. And, sorry, December. You're right. Preparing for January. Hello. Um, <laughs> December 23rd, and then we also have one on at 12, 4, and 6 on the 24th. Uh, again, you know, we just are encouraging folks if they're comfortable with that. Uh, if you can go to either the one on the 23rd or if you go to the 24th, particularly try to push either to the 12th or the 6th. And really the reason why is that 4 o'clock one is typically um, packed to the max with folks that are, you know, just kind of really by and large uninvolved. Uh, it's really when a lot of unchurched people come. And so we want to make room for that. So if you're willing to do that, obviously if you don't want, uh, that's a soft ask. We realize that if every year y'all have always gone to the four o'clock service, you know, and it's gonna wreck your, your family plans. We don't wanna do that. Um, but if you could, are willing to do that, we would love to have you do that. So uh, tonight we are gonna be continuing our series in the story of heaven. Um, we're again, looking at, the, at Revelation 21. Before we dive in, I think it's important for us to establish a little bit about Revelation. So uh, the Apostle John wrote Revelation. What's happening is he's later in life, he has been exiled, or he's on the island of Patmos, and God gives him this gives him this supernatural vision for what things are going to look like at the end of times. Now, when you read the book of Revelation, it's really important to understand that most of it is descriptive and not prescriptive. What I mean by that is it's describing what's going to happen at the end times, and it's not necessarily prescribing a mechanism for how we are to live our lives. Now, that being said, the, God's Word is alive and active, right? And so because of that, I, I just, every time I teach, I always ask God, what do you want me to know, and what do you want me to do? And then therefore I ask, what do you want your children to know, and what do you want your children to do? And so because of that, even though Revelation is mostly prescriptive, mean, or sorry, mostly descriptive, describing the end times, I still think that there are some practical things that we can take from this passage in Revelation and actually apply them in our lives. And so that's what my hope is tonight. I'm going to connect this passage uh, with another passage in Matthew 6. In Revelation chapter 21, this is kind of the picture of the end times. This is a picture of heaven. This is John writing. Not sure if it's John or a scribe, but John is the one who received this vision. So we're going to read a good chunk of it. If you didn't get your Bible reading in, uh, congratulations, you're going to get uh, a lot of reading in today. Here we go, John chapter 20, or sorry, Revelation chapter 21, if you're there, say, I'm there. I'm there. All right, here it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. Y'all say gone. 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 And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look. God's home is now among his people. Y'all, this, this is some, every part of the Bible is good, but this, this is some good Bible, y'all. So uh, just hang on for this. It's about to get gooder. Yes, I know that's not a word. I just made it up. Here we go. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Verse 5, and the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. Then he said to me, write this down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. In other words, I want my children for generations to read of this, right? And he said, and he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Skip down to verse 11. It's This, this is now describing... Again, de descriptive, describing what the new heavens are going to look like. It says it's shown with the glory, I'll say glory, glory, of God, and it sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper, as clear as crystal. And then uh, skip down to verse 18. It says the wall was made of jasper, and the city was pure gold, as clear as glass. We'll talk more about that later. 
The wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with 12 precious stones. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth is there for your reading enjoyment, the sixth <laughs> is also there for your reading enjoyment, as is the seventh and the eighth and the ninth and the tenth and the eleventh and the twelfth is amethyst. I mean, I know how to say them. I'm just making sure y'all are getting your reading in. That was a joke. Yeah. Uh, just keeping it interesting. Verse 21, the twelve gates were made of single pearls. Each, or Sorry, were made of pearls. Each gate was made from a single pearl. And the main street was pure gold, as clear, notice that, as glass. I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty said, and the Lamb are its temple. And then verse 23 says, And the city had no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light. Y'all, that is, that is good right there. I mean, if you're a teacher, that's like... That's like a, a field day right there. You could have a whole sermon or a whole message on that. All right, I want, I want to stop there, but I want to flip over to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to use Matthew chapter 6 as a means to kind of interpret this passage. So this is Jesus teaching a Sermon on the Mount, and this is him teaching his disciples to pray. And this passage will probably be very familiar to you. Uh, it's, it's Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to read just verses 9 and 10. This is Jesus telling uh, those gathered around him how to pray. He's teaching about prayer and fasting, and it says, Our Father in heaven, y'all say heaven. heaven. And then it says, May your name be kept holy, or another translation might say, Hallowed be your name. And then notice this, it says, May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you're an underliner or a highlighter, I would encourage you to highlight that. On earth, as it is in heaven. I want to take the next few minutes, and I want to, I want to talk to you from this idea or this thought or this framework. Again, in line of kind of making revelation practical, I want to talk from this idea of, as it, this, the, the subject of tonight's lesson is, as it is in heaven, and then we're going to talk about the old and the new. The old and the new. And I'm going to explain more what that means, but let's ask Jesus to show us what he wants us to see. Father, thank you so much for this time, thank you for this community. God, we ask that you speak in these moments. You know that I don't have a thing to say, but we pray that you help your word to come alive. Um, and God, we just thank you for the gift of community. We ask that you speak to us right now. Um, God, and if it's your will, we do pray that the Astros will win the World Series. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Did any of y'all have a family motto growing up? Anybody have a family motto or any sort of family saying, perfect, I'm starting off connecting with my audience. Perfect. Well, uh, we did not necessarily have a family motto, but there were several sayings that my parents said a lot growing up. Um, my dad liked to adopt Bill Cosby's family motto, which was, I'm the dad, I brought you into the world, and I can take you out of the world, right? Yeah. That's, he said that a lot, especially when we were in trouble, right? Um, my sister Megan and her husband, they have two twin boys, and they have a third boy that's like five days older than our second. Um, and particularly Megan has adopted this saying with uh, my, my two nephews that are now three years old. And this is what they say every night kind of before their prayer time. Uh, Megan says, obey mommy and daddy. Don't hurt yourself or others. And then she says, because their, their last name is Smalley, by the way. And then she says, because we are Smalleys and Smalleys are, and she pauses and when they first started doing this, the boys would just scream. They would go, nice, right? Because smallies are nice. So when she first instituted this family motto, they were so excited about it, right? Like, okay, well, bay mommy and daddy, don't hurt yourself or others because we are smallies and smallies are nice. Well, if you call them right now and ask them to say this, when you get to that part that says smallies are, they're like, nice. I mean, they're like over it, right? They get it. It's been beat through their brain, right? Uh, another motto, my mom used to always say, blood is thicker than water. I don't know if y'all have ever heard that saying. Some of you have. Um, when, when my mom used to tell us this when we were like six or seven, we'd be like, right. And I would go to my sister and be like, what does that even mean? Like, she just didn't really explain it a lot on the front end. Later on, she would come to explain that it means, hey, your family is most important. And ultimately, your family relationships trump any other relationship you have and she was trying to say hey one day we may or may not be here you know we're not going to live forever and so ultimately all you have is your siblings right i've heard kurt taylor say that he tells his kids every day whose choice is it to make it a great day and the, his kids go our choice and again same thing first started our choice now if you ask him our choice right <laughs> so kind of get over it right eventually 
What's my point in all that? Well, a motto can tell a lot, right? It can tell a lot. It can describe uh, further about what something is and particularly what it is about. Chick-fil-A has this great motto uh, that says Chick-fil-A, or it's a, their motto is to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us and to have a positive influence on all who come into contact with Chick-fil-A. Tells you a lot about what they're about, right? When you've been to Chick-fil-A, that probably makes sense now because you know that's in every single thing they do. My point in all of this is that, go with me on this, so I feel like if the Bible were to have a motto, right? If you could kind of give a subtitle to the Bible, like for, especially for someone who doesn't know what it's about or they've never experienced it before, if you could put one phrase to the Bible to describe it more, I think that it would be on earth as it is in heaven, right? That kind of tells you a little bit of what it's about, the mission, the message, that, hey, Jesus has a kingdom. He came to establish that kingdom. He wants us to live on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I want to explain, using this passage, how we go about doing that. Now, before we get there, I want to make sure I explain this more thoroughly. Theologically, there are some things that we cannot and will not ever be able to do as they are done in heaven, right? As this passage tells us, there's no more sin, there's no more mourning, there's no more crying, there's no more suffering. Obviously, those things don't translate. However, Jesus did come to earth to establish his kingdom here, and I do believe as Jesus' followers, our goal is to make much of him, right? And so there are certainly some things from this passage that we can infer and therefore apply into our lives so that when we live on earth as it is in heaven, hopefully we're pointing people back to that main thing so that they know ultimately what we're about and ultimately that our hope is not tied here on this earth, but our hope is set in heaven. Amen? Amen. All right, let's look at uh, uh, Revelation verse 21. So there's really, I've just got two points for you tonight. Y'all know normally I'm the three-point guy. Keep it real simple, okay? We got two observations from this passage uh, as far as how we can implement this heaven coming to on earth okay how do we go about doing that when i hear that okay yes i'm excited i want to bring heaven to earth but tell me how we do that okay so in verse 20 or sorry in chapter uh, revelation chapter 21 verse 1 it says then i saw a new heaven and a new earth and then it says for the old heaven y'all say old oh. the old heaven and the old earth had gone and the sea was also gone and then it says, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. So I want to stop right there. So, so really the first way, if we want to bring heaven to earth, we want to live in a way that points people to the hope of heaven, what do we have to do? Well, first we have to, we have to be out with the old. We have to be out with the old, right? We have to get rid of the old things in our life, right? So John is writing and he's talking about the end times. When Jesus comes back, and when everyone who knows or has a relationship with him will be reunited with him, God's going to completely wipe away everything that was old, right? Notice that he says the old was gone. It's interesting that he talks about the sea being gone. So throughout scripture and in ancient times, the sea was actually a metaphor for evil, for um, that nowadays when we think of the sea, we think like vacation, hello, I'm going on a cruise, right? Like that's, that's kind of how we think of it now, nowadays. But back in ancient times, the sea was actually terrifying because people died on the wreck. That's street terms for regularly, right? I mean, they just, they, they would go out and they may or may not make it back if they took a boat trip out to sea, right? So the sea was a picture of evil or bad things, right? And so John says, he makes it clear God revealing to him, he makes it very clear that the sea was gone. Translation, that evil is gone, right? And so he makes it very, very clear that the old is gone. Notice that he says the new Jerusalem. He's not, this is not a revamped version of Jerusalem. This is something that is brand new. Um, have y'all ever heard of the cities in, in London, York or Hampshire or London? Most of us have heard of London, right? Well, in the United States, there is a New York there is a state called New Hampshire, and then there is actually in Connecticut, there's a small city called New London. Those cities are not revamps, although I'm sure there's probably some things that may happen to overlap from those old cities and new cities, but those are brand new cities, right? So in the same way, John, God is telling John, and John is therefore telling us that these things are being made brand new, right? And here's where we get really practical. I find that so many times in my own Christian journey, a lot of times I fail 
to get rid of the old things in my life, right? That so many times we continue to go back to the same struggles that we fought even before we ever came to know Christ. And so if we want to live a life that ultimately points people to the hope of heaven, we have to be willing to get rid of that old stuff in our life. The way that I wrote it down, if you're a note taker, I would encourage you to write this down. Many times we fail to experience new joy because we fail to get rid of old junk, right? We fail to experience all that God would have for us in this life because we fail to get rid of the things that he wanted us to move past in our old life pre-knowing Christ and pre-walking with him. And I'm so thankful that we have the hope of heaven to look forward to, but let's not wait to eternity to get rid of the old things in our life that God does not want for us to walk in. I want to illustrate this. Y'all know I'm a prop guy, so I'm going to ask Mr. Greg Moore to come up here and help me with this. Let's give him a round of applause, folks. So we have here, I want to make sure Zoomers can see this. So we have here a uh, very fancy jacket, right? Not really that fancy, it's just a jacket. So uh, I think it's from H&M, pretty cheap. So yeah, hey, it, it uh, does the job, right? So I'm gonna ask Sir Greg to go ahead and put this on. Watch, he's gonna walk out of here and keep this. <laughs> yeah, feels great, right? Okay, so yeah, it looks pretty good. It looks pretty spiffy, right? Okay, so um, here's what we're gonna do now. Things are about to get serious around here. Fortunately, when you have a dad that's a cop, you have some connections, right? All right, so now I'm going to ask Greg to, uh, he, he, I saw him speeding when he was on the way up here, so that's why we're doing this. Right now. He, was, he was speeding through the parking lot, so therefore he is under arrest for doing that, right? He was speed walking up the stairs. He was speed walking up the stairs. That's, that's a better way of putting it. Yeah, well, no, I actually had you keep him in front on purpose, so. Now, what I want to ask you to do is, will you go ahead and take that jacket off for me? <laughs> Think so? Uh, let's see how far you can get it off. Go ahead. I'm, I'll be impressed. It was from the bottom, right? What? Did you get it from the bottom over your head? Over your head? Grab like the maybe, like maybe like this? Your hands. Maybe like this, up and over, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh. He's, he's getting it part of the way off, okay, but, uh, huh, it's kind of a problem, right, huh, okay, interesting, all right, let's put this back on, here we go, all right, uh -oh. there we go, there we go, now we got it, all right, so now, here we go, don't worry about how it, how it looks there, there we go, yeah, you're going to go, sorry, right. you're not going to have it anyway, so now, I've got the key, Thank goodness, what if I was like, all right, let's pray now, have a good night. <laughs> he would be pretty upset. All right, so now we got the key, but here's what I want to, to show you guys, okay? So, um, hopefully this is the right key, Lord Jesus. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, he tested it before you. Oh my gosh, some new bracelets. Huh? That's right. Kids got a new Christmas present. All right, so here, here's now what I want to illustrate, though. I want you to leave your hands together as if they were handcuffed. And now try to take the jacket off again with leaving your hands together. Yeah, do not separate them. Same place, right? Here's what I found about our lives. A lot of us have encountered Jesus and we've been set free. Yet we're still living like this, right? We have the perfect capacity to be able to break our hands free because we have been set free. But yet so many times in my life and all of our lives, we still hold on to those old things and those old habits and those old ways that God wants us to walk in freedom from. And so my question to myself and to all of us are, what are the things in our life that we need to get rid of so that we can help point people to the hope of heaven? Let's give Greg a round of applause. <laughs> You need a bar at some time. If you want to uh, wear it to Christmas Eve, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> Just as long as it's the 23rd at 6 or the 24th at 12, right? <laughs> so what what are the things in our life that we need to get rid of? So now we've established we got to get out with the old, right? But now once we've gotten rid of the old, 
there's got to be something else after that, right? So here's where we pick up. Um, let's look at verse um, 2 through 7. So it says, And I saw the holy city, um, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and he will be, and they will be his people. God will wipe. God will, he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And verse five says, and the one sitting on the throne said, "Look, I am making everything new." Y'all say new. new. And then he said to me, "Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true." Now let's skip down to verse 10 and 11. So, and this is John. It says, So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. So this is the new Jerusalem. And it says, It was descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like precious stone, like jasper, as clear. Y'all say clear. clear. As clear as crystal. Skip down to verse 18. It says, The wall was made of jasper, and the city was made of pure gold, as clear, y'all say clear, clear, as glass. The wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with twelve precious stones. We read those earlier. Uh, skip down to verse 21. The twelve gates were made of pearls. Each gate was from a single pearl. And the main street was pure gold as, there it is again, clear. Y'all say clear. Clear. As glass. I saw no temple in the city for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of sun or moon for the glory of God illuminates the city and the Lamb is its light. So we need to get out with the old. And then the next thing we need to do is in with the new, right? In with the new. Well, the question is, how do we go about doing that, right? How do we make this practical and how do we actually apply this into our lives? A lot of this is very, he, and again, he's describing what the end times are going to look like. This is exactly what the new heavens and the new earth are going to look like. There's going to be a new heaven and a new Jerusalem that we're all going to live in. Uh, notice that it's made from the most precious things that are on this planet, right? The most amazing, exotic things. So exotic that we cannot even pronounce them, right? I mean, they're just amazing. That was a joke, right? We, we know how to pronounce them. I just was... Kind of joking that uh, I didn't know how to pronounce them, right? So there are exotic things, but how do we actually bring in or usher in the new in our lives? Well, very simple. we got to act, A-C-T, like Jesus, okay? And I'm going to explain what those three things mean. The first thing, we got to act, A-C-T, if you're a note taker, like Jesus. So the first thing, the A, stands for that our life should be appealing. Appealing, right? Notice that these gems are pretty fancy things, right? So... And notice particularly that heaven's foundations or the things that we're going to walk on are the most precious things that we know in this life, right? Jasper and gold and amethyst and all of these types of things are things that we're going to be kind of building things with, right? So in other words, what it's saying is the things that we count costly here in this life are going to be but side business because everything in heaven is going to be so much about Jesus, right? That Everything about him is everything about heaven is going to be utterly and completely consumed with him. So those jewels, though, they're still very appealing, right? I mean, if you were to walk in here and we had all these jewels laid out, we probably would have a crowd gathered around here, right? Some of us would try to be running off and selling it on eBay, right? Like new Christmas presents, right? Um, that's very fancy, nice things. And so the way that we kind of take that and translate it into our lives is as Christians. Our life should be appealing, right? Now, let me explain that. Appealing doesn't always mean earthly and material things, right? Matter of fact, more often than not, and really in biblical terms, appealing does not mean earthly things, right? Appealing means when the world looks at us, they see that because of our relationship with Jesus, because our focus is set on heaven, our focus is set on what John is writing about, we can have hope even in the middle of hurts of life, right? We can have purpose even in the middle of the pain that we walk through in this life. That is how, friends, that our lives are appealing to a world that is so broken and so desperate and so much needs the gospel. So our lives first need to be appealing. The second thing that they need to be is that they need to be clear. They need to be clear. Notice how many times, that's what the C is, clear. Notice how many times that he says, these elements were clear, right? He talks about the jasper being clear. He talks about the streets being gold, but also clear, 
I don't know about y'all, I've seen a lot of gold in my life, not that much to be honest, it's like, whoa, what's going on with you, Russ? Like, now, I've seen some gold in my life, but I've never seen clear gold, right? I've seen some things that are like this, but I've never seen clear elements like this. Well, what's it saying? I think that what this is referencing is the fact that although these things are very fancy and great and awesome, they pale in comparison to the true treasure of heaven, right? And in other words, something that is clear, you can see right through it, right? Mm -hmm. So what it's saying is that in heaven, although these things are awesome, our focus is going to be so consumed with the throne that we're just going to see right through it, right? So those things that we count costly in this life, in essence, that when the world looks at us, they should be able to see right through it and see nothing but Jesus, right? So we should, not only should we, and, and clear things, off, like look right here, it's a perfect example. Even though this window is clear, see how it still reflects, right? It still has the ability to reflect. Same thing in our lives. Like our lives should be so clear and so transparent that we're we're walking with Jesus in such a way that when people look at us, they don't see us, but they see just a picture of what Jesus has done in our lives. So our lives have to be clear. We have to be pointing back people back to the throne and what God has done in our lives. So uh, here, if you're a note taker, I would encourage you to jot things down uh, or jot this down. Uh, there's no better way to reflect God's glory or live in a clear way than by being willing to share His story. Right? That's ultimately how we can reflect God's glory. Is when we go out of here and we don't just gain knowledge, we don't just gain information, but we go out into this world with the confidence and the boldness to be able to share what God has done in our lives and how He has changed our lives, and ultimately pointing people to that true treasure in heaven. The last thing, uh, the, the way we can usher in the new in our lives, so we've established that our lives need to be appealing, they need to be clear, and then we need to make sure that we live for the true treasure. That's what the T is, treasure. Now in Matthew chapter six, I wanna flip back over there, Jesus begins by kind of helping us understand what treasure is like. So in Matthew chapter six, verse 19 through 21, He's, this is, again, the Sermon on the Mount. It's probably the greatest sermon ever preached. And Jesus starts to begin to teach the disciples and those around him how you really define treasure. So he starts to define treasure no longer in earthly things, but in light of heaven, right? And so he says in verse 19, and this is an interesting passage because not many times in Jesus' teaching does he use parallel opposites. But this is one of the few places that he actually does. So in verse 19, he says, Do not store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. But then he says, the polar opposite, he says, But do store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. And then this is the key verse here. He says, For where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be, right? So in other words, what we value will ultimately point people to what our lives are really about, right? So he's setting their eyes on heaven, and what this passage is very clearly telling us is that if our treasure is not in earthly things, is not in amethyst, is not in gold, is not in getting ahead, it's not even in, it's as great as wanting to be a good parent, that's a great thing, it's a, a whole new thing that we're focusing on in our lives, ultimately, if I'm not trying to be like Jesus first, I don't have a chance to be a good parent, much less sometimes I'm getting lost in ultimately the main thing, which is focusing on the hope and the treasure that lies in heaven. So, uh, here's where this gets kind of really practical for us this Christmas season, so we've I know this is a lot to cover with Revelation. I, it, we could spend, there are guys that have, have degrees on one chapter of this book, right? I mean, you, you're the guys that have doctorates in this thing, right? We could spend weeks and weeks and weeks. We don't have time to unpack it all, right? But here's the thing that God just, I mean, he hit me like a two by four this week as I was studying. So we're entering into the Christmas season, right? What is the Christmas season about? It's Emmanuel, God with us, right? Here's what God hit me with. Jesus left all of this to come be with us, right? He left this to come be with us. In other words, I don't know about y'all, but I don't know if y'all have ever been demoted before. I have, uh, not here necessarily on staff, but 
Um, when you are a former professional baseball player, there's a reason why you're former, right? Because you're not any good. So part of that process was I got sent down at one point, right? So I, most of us don't like being demoted, right? It's not really fun, right? But Jesus took the ultimate demotion in stepping out of heaven to come to earth so that we could receive the ultimate promotion. That's mind-blowing. So as we enter this Christmas season, here's the thing that so many of us, myself, I'm talking to the man in the mirror first and foremost, so many of us are guilty of, we've recognized that Jesus took this demotion so that we can receive this promotion. And yet so many times in my life, and I'm sure all of our lives, we walk out of the door and we don't promote that promotion. Meaning that we don't tell others about this promotion, this game-changing promotion that we all have had the opportunity to receive through the gift of his son, Jesus. That so many times in my life, I walk out the door and I don't act any differently. Like I've been set free from the eternal separation from God, right? And that's, that's what God is charging us with, friends, is that he wants us to be different. If we want, if, we, if our treasure is truly defined in heaven, then we will walk out of these doors knowing, okay, Jesus took the ultimate demotion so that I can receive this promotion. Now I'm going to tell everybody, right? How many times have you been promoted on the other side? Rarely do we ever sit silent about it, right? We're like, ah, I don't know if you know this or not, but like I'm the executive VPO of 45YZ of uh, my company. It's no big deal. I mean, it's a promotion, but it's no big deal, right? Like we, we love to talk about regular promotions, right? Yet so many times in my life, I don't talk about the ultimate promotion, right? That I have been saved from eternal separation from God. And when we do that, when we get out with the old and we usher in the new, the way we go about that is we promote this promotion that God has done in our lives. I want to close with this story because it's a good picture of that. A friend of mine named Taylor, uh, when I was serving in the singles ministry, Taylor showed up here and he had kind of been around the church before, but he had never really like I mean, he, he kind of, he associated Christianity by going to church, right? Like, and that's obviously when you read the Bible, we know that that's not what a Christian life is like, right? That's, that's more religion than it is relationship, right? And so as I had the privilege of meeting him, I started to talk with him and we had lunch several times and I, I had the opportunity to share the gospel with him and, and talk to him about what Jesus did and, and talk to him about this demotion that Jesus took so that we could receive this promotion. Um, and Taylor in talking with him at first he kind of processed it but then he called me out of the blue like one random Tuesday and said hey I want to come by your office this is when I was still in our second fit um, you know so I was serving in singles ministry but I was my main job was kind of overseeing the gym downstairs and so I had him come by my office and literally you know I kind of walked through the gospel with him again I did the old school bridge diagram here's us here's God Jesus bridged the gap and I asked him you know is that something you've ever done and he said not really. I've kind of gone to church, but I've never really placed my faith in Jesus. And I said, well, do you want to do that? And he said, yes. And literally right there in my office, he prayed to receive Christ, which was so incredible, right? I was fired up. And so I talked to him, as we do, about next steps from that. And I said, hey, here's what I think you should start doing. I think you should become a member of our church. And, and I, well, first of all, I said, I think you should get baptized. And I said, as a part of that, typically what we encourage people to do is to, to join our church. And the reason why is because when you join... You can start serving in many ways. There's a lot of ways where visitors can serve, but joining our church, it opens up the full gamut to being able to serve anywhere and everywhere. And so because he was so fired up about accepting Jesus, he didn't need a whole lot of convincing. He was like, all right, let's go, right? I mean, he is ready and ready to go. And so what we encourage people to do, many of you have been to our services before, we encourage people to walk forward at the end. And the reason why is because we think that that's kind of an outward sign of what God has done in, inwardly in their life. And the thing we always tell people is you never know how God can use that moment of you walking forward. They may not know you from Adam, but they, God may be working in their heart and in their life. And seeing you stand up and walk forward is the thing that the Holy Spirit uses to nudge them to follow after what God's doing in their life. So I told him that. I tell this as in, a lot of our staff do. You never know how God can use that, right? Here's, this is a good story so far. It's about to get gooder. So typically what we do, or at least what I've tried to do, that, that can feel really intimidating to walk forward in front of eight school people, right? And so uh, typically what I do is I say, hey, 
A lot of times our staff sits up at the front and then I'll just say, hey, so A, we're closer. It's a lot easier to walk from here to there than it is to walk from the back of the room. And so a lot of times I'll say, hey, let, let me walk with you. Like it's just easier to go in company, right? And so again, he didn't, he would have walked up by himself, but he was like, sure, that's great. Let's do that, right? So this is Tuesday that all this happens. He gives his life to Jesus. He's ready to join our church. And then we, we scheduled his baptism for like two weeks out, right? Unbeknownst to him, this is where the story gets crazy. So him and his dad were um, not really that close. And the Sunday that after the Tuesday, he gave his life to Jesus. His dad just happened to come to a church. And just happened to come to Second Baptist. And just happened to come to the same service that he came to. His dad is not a believer. It, nominally, maybe checked a box at some point, but not really a believer. His dad's sitting in the back with uh, the, the girlfriend that he was dating at the time. I think his parents had split when he was young. And the girlfriend sees him walk forward. And she says, I think that's Taylor. And his dad was like, there's no way. I mean, he's not, trust me, he's not a church guy, right? And she says, no, 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 I really think that that's him. And so sure enough, they, they walk over to our little new member area and sure enough, it was Taylor. And the best part was not even what happened then. So the next Sunday was the Sunday that Taylor got baptized. No, sorry, he got baptized two Sundays later. The, the, immediately the following Sunday, that, that catalyst right there started a bunch of conversations with Taylor and his dad and his dad's girlfriend. And the best part wasn't even seeing Taylor accept Christ. Wasn't even seeing him walk forward and join our church. The very next Sunday... I'm sitting there in church, and all of a sudden I see Taylor stand up, and I'm thinking, bro, you've already done this. You're good, man. Like, <laughs> right? Like, we've already, you don't have to go again, right? Once saved, always saved, right? And then his dad stands up, and then his dad's girlfriend, and they all walk forward, and his dad rededicates his life to Christ. And then a year later, his dad passed. Suddenly, tragic. I didn't find this out until about two weeks ago. I did a wedding. For a friend that she was the first invite that brought him here. If Taylor hadn't defined treasure and told people and shown people about this promotion that he had received, who knows where his dad would be today. But we can know without any doubt exactly where his dad is today. And his dad got to see him the following Sunday. So that Taylor joined on July 8th, he gave his, or he joined, he gave left Christ on July 8th, his dad joined the 15th, and he got baptized the 22nd, so his dad got to see that, and it was about a year later, I think it was July 27th of 2019, that his dad went home to be with the Lord. Friends, we never know what God can do when we are bold, and when we are willing to say, Lord, use me. I don't know enough, I don't, I'm not smart enough, I don't know all the things, but God, you want to use me, so let us go out of here out with the old, in with the new. How do we do that? We act like Jesus. How do we act like Jesus? We tell people about him. We tell, we tell people about the promotion that we have been so freely given. Let me pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that it is alive and active. God, we ask that you help us to walk out of your bold um, and help us to um, just tell about the story that you've done for us. God, we ask that you give us the courage to do that. We know that's hard. We know that can feel intimidating, but God, we pray that you just help us to be people that point uh, others to the hope of heaven. We thank you for that hope, that no matter what we face in this life, no matter how many pandemics we face, God, that you're on the throne and that you're sovereign and in control. And uh, God, we ask that you speak to us as we head into the worship, and we pray that you give us a boldness this Christmas season. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I forgot to show y'all. This is Taylor. Yeah, he went public. Yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool. Russell, you always feel good. Um, just a few quick things. Um, Christmas party next Saturday night. Uh, Veritas, I believe, is playing. You are correct.